Well, this is a highly significant article. Um, the plundering of Ukraine by corrupt American Democrats. And this is an interview with uh, Oleg Tsarev, who I'll describe in a minute who he is, reveals the alleged identity of the Trump Ukraine whistleblower. So uh, this has been, uh, this appeared in the UNS review uh, today and it has reappeared. Uh, Hal Turner has uh, carried it. So I'm just going to read his his version. So this is Mr. Israel Shamir. I've read his articles before. And this is Oleg Tsaryev, uh, who used to be a Ukrainian MP. So, top Democrats in the United States are involved in the plundering of Ukraine. New names, boggling, mind-boggling accounts. The mysterious whistleblower whose report had unleashed the impeachment is named in the exclusive interview given to the UNS review by a prominent Ukrainian politician, an ex-member of parliament of four terms, a candidate for Ukraine's presidency, Mr. Oleg Tsaryev. Mr. Tsaryev, a tall, agile, graceful man, a good speaker and a prolific writer, has been a leading and popular Ukrainian politician before the 2014 putsch. He stayed in Ukraine after President Yanukovych's flight, ran for the presidency against Mr. Poroshenko, and eventually had to go to exile due to multiple threats to his life. Uh, during the failed attempt to secede, he was elected the Speaker of the Parliament of Novorossiya, southeastern Ukraine. I spoke to him in Crimea, where he lives, in the pleasant seaside town of Yalta. Tsaryev still has many supporters in Ukraine and is a leader of the opposition to the Kiev regime. So, Oleg, you followed Biden's story from its very inception. Biden is not the only Dem politician involved in Ukrainian corruption schemes, is he? Indeed, John Kerry, Secretary of State in Obama's administration, was his partner in crime. But Joe Biden was number one. During the Obama presidency, Biden was the U.S. pro-counsel for Ukraine and he was involved in many corruption schemes. He tra authorized transfer of $3 billion of the U.S. taxpayers' money to the post-coup government of Ukraine. The money was stolen and Biden took a big share of the spoils. It has a story of ripping the U.S. taxpayer and the Ukrainian customer off for the benefit of a few corruptioners. American and Ukrainian, and it is a story of Kiev regime and its dependence on the US and the IMF. Ukraine has a few mid-sized deposits of natural gas sufficient for domestic household consumption. The cost of its production was quite low and the Ukrainians got used to pay pennies for their gas. Actually, it was so cheap to produce that the Ukraine could provide all its households with free gas for heating and cooking, just like Libya did. Despite low consumer price, the gas companies, like Burisma, had very high profits and very little expenditure. During the 2014 coup, IMF demanded to raise the price of gas for the domestic consumer to European levels, and the new President Petro Poroshenko obliged them. The prices went sky high. The Ukrainians were forced to pay many times more for their cooking and heating, and huge profits went to the coffers of the gas companies. Instead of raising taxes or lowering prices, President Poroshenko demanded the gas companies to pay him or subsidize his projects. He said that he arranged the price hike. It means he should be considered a partner. Burisma Gas Company had to pay extortion money to the President Poroshenko. Eventually, its founder and owner, Mr. Nikolai Zlochevsky, decided to invite some important Westerners into the company's board of directors, hoping it would moderate Poroshenko's appetites. It brought in Biden's son, uh, Hunter John Kerry, Polish ex-president uh, Koshnevsky, but it didn't help him. Poroshenko became furious that the fattened calf may escape him and asked the Attorney General Shokin to 
investigate Burisma, trusting some irregularities would emerge. Uh, Attorney General Shokin immediately discovered that Burisma had paid these stars between fifty and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars per month each just for being on its list of directors. This is illegal by the Ukrainian tax code. It can't be recognized as legitimate expenditure. At that time, Biden, the father, entered the fray. He called Poroshenko and gave him six hours to close the case against his son. Otherwise, $1 billion of the U.S. taxpayers' funds won't pass to the Ukrainian corruptioners Zlochevsky. The Burisma owner paid Biden well for this conversation. He received between 2 and $10 million, according to different sources. Shokin said he can't close the case within six hours. Poroshenko uh, sacked him and installed Mr. Lutsenko in his stead. Lutsenko was willing to dismiss the case of Burisma but he also could not do it in a day or even in a week. Biden, as we know, could not keep his trap shut by talking about him, about the pressure he put on Poroshenko. He incriminated himself. <sighs> Meanwhile, Mr. Shokin gave evidence that Biden put pressure on Poroshenko to fire him, and now it was confirmed. The case was given to the U.S. lawyers in connection with another case, the Fertish case. So what is Fertish case? The Democrats wanted to get another Ukrainian oligarch, Mr. Fertash, to the U.S. and make him confess that he had illegally supported Trump's campaign for the sake of Russia. Fertash had been arrested in Vienna, Austria, where there he fought extradition to the United States. His lawyers claimed it was a purely political case and they used Mr. Shokin's deposition to substantiate their claim. For this reason, the information provide, supplied by Shokin is not easily reversible, even if Shokin were willing, and he is not. He has stated under oath that the Democrats pressurized him to help and extradite Firtash to the US, although he had no standing in this purely American issue. It seems that Mrs. Clinton believes that Firtash's funds helped Trump to win the elections, an extremely unlikely thing, says Mr. Tsaryev. Talking about Burisma and Biden, what is this billion dollars of aid that Biden could give or withhold? It is U.S. aid money, the main channel of the U.S. aid for support of democracy. First billion dollars of U.S. aid came to the Ukraine in 2014. This was authorized by Joe Biden, while for Ukraine, the papers were signed by Mr. Turchina, the acting president. The Ukrainian constitution does not know of such a position, and Turchina, the acting president, had no right to sign neither a legal nor a financial document. Thus, all the documents that were signed by him, in fact, had no legal force. However, Biden countersigned the papers signed by Turchinov and allocated money for Ukraine, and the money was stolen by the Democrats and their Ukrainian counterparts. Two years ago, that is, already under President Trump, the United States began to investigate the allocation of $3 billion. It was allocated in 2014, 2015, and 2016. $1 billion per year. The investigation showed that the documents were falsified, the money was transferred to Ukraine, and stolen. The investigators tracked each payment, discovered where the money went, where it was spent, and how it was stolen. As a result, on October 2018, the U.S. Department of Justice opened a criminal case for abuse of power and embezzlement of American taxpayers' money. Among the accused, there are two consecutive financial ministers of the Ukraine, Ms. Natalia Ann Yareshko, who served 2014-16, and Mr. Alexander 
Daniluk, who served 2016-18 to 18 in three U.S. banks. The investigation caused U.S. aid to cease issuing grants since August 2019. As Trump said, now the U.S. does not give away money and does not impose democracy. The money was allocated with a flagrant, flagrant violation of American law. There was no risk assessment, no audio, audit reports. Normally, the U.S. aid, when allocating cash, always prepares a substantial package of documents. But the billions were given to Ukraine completely without documents. The criminal case on the embezzlement of U.S. aid funds has been signed personally by the U.S. Attorney General, so these issues are very much alive. Sam Kislin was involved in this investigation. He's a good friend and association of Giuliani, Trump's lawyer and an ex-mayor of New York. Kislin is well known in Kiev, and I have many friends who are Sam's friends, said Tsarev. I learned of his progress because some of my friends were detained in the United States or interrogated in Ukraine. They briefed me about this. It appears that Burisma is just the tip of the scandal, the tip of the iceberg. If Trump will carry on and use what was already initiated and investigated, the whole headquarters of the Democratic Party will come down. They will not be able to hold elections. I have no right to name names, but believe me, leading functionaries of the Democratic Party are involved. Poroshenko was aware of that. He gave orders to declare Sam Kislin persona non grata. Once the old man, he is over 80, flew into Kiev airport and he was not allowed to come in. He spent the night in detention and was flown back to the US next day. Poroshenko had been totally allied with Clinton camp. And President Zelensky, is he free from Clintonite Democrats' influence? If he were, there would not be the scandal of the Trump phone call, how the Democrats learned of this call and its alleged content. The official version says there was a CIA man, a whistleblower, who reported to the Democrats what the version does not clarify where this whistleblower was located during the call. I tell you, he was located in Kiev and he was president at the conversation at Ukrainian President Zelensky's side. This man was perhaps a CIA asset, but he was also a close associate of George Soros and the Ukrainian high-ranking official. His name is Alexander Danilyuk. He is also the man the investigation of Sam Kislin and the, of the DOJ had led to the finance minister of Ukraine at the time, the man who was responsible for the embezzlement of three billion US taxpayers' best dollars. The DOJ issued an order for his arrest. Naturally, he is devoted to Biden personally and to the Dems in general. I would not trust his version of the phone call at all. Daniel Luk was supposed to accompany uh, President Zelensky on his visit to Washington, but he was informed that there is an order for his arrest. He remained in Kiev, and soon afterwards, the hell of the alleged leaked phone call broke out. Zelensky administration investigated and concluded that the leak was done by Mr. Daniluk, who is known for his close relations with George Soros and with Mr. Biden. Alexander Daniluk had been fired. However, he did not admit his guilt and said the leak was done by his sworn enemy, the head of the president's administration officer, Mr. Andrei Bogdan, who allegedly framed Daniluk. This is not the only case of US-connected corruption in Ukraine. There is Amos J. Hochstein, a protege of former Vice President Joe Biden, who had served in the uh, Barack Obama administration as the Assistant Secretary of State for Energy Resources. He hangs on in the Ukraine. 
together with an American citizen, Andrew Favorov, the de deputy director of Nafto Gaz, he organized a very expensive reverse gas import into Ukraine. In this scheme, the Russian gas is bought by Europeans and afterwards sold to Ukraine with a wonderful margin. In reality, the gas comes from Russia directly, but payments go via Hochstein. It is much more costly than to buy directly from Russia. Ukrainian people pay while the margin is collected by Hochstein and Favorov. Now they plan to import liquefied gas from the United States at even higher price. Again, the price will be paid by Ukrainians while the profits will go to Hochstein and Favorov. In all these scams, there are a number of Clinton and spooks who are fully integrated in the Democratic Party. A former head of CIA, Robert James Woolsey, who now sits on the board of directors of Velta, producing Ukrainian titanium. Woolsey is a neocon, a member of the Project for the New American Century, pro-Israel think tank, and a man who relentlessly pushed for the Iraq war. A typical Democrat spook, now he gets profits from Ukraine ore deposits. One of the best Ukrainian corruption stories is connected with Andreas Budkevichus, the former Minister of Defence from 1996 to 2000 and a member of the Seimas, the Parliament of Post-Soviet Lithuania. Mr. A.B. is supposedly working for MI6 and is now a member of the notorious Institute for Statecraft, a UK deep state propaganda outfit involved in disinformation operations, subversion of the democratic process, and building Russophobia and the idea of a new Cold War. In 1991, he commanded snipers that shot Lithuanian protesters. The kills were ascribed to the Soviet armed forces, and the last Soviet president, Mr. Gorbachev, ordered spe speedy withdrawal of his troops from Lithuania. Mr. A.B. became the Minister of Defence of his independent nation. In 1997, the Honourable Minister of Defence, quote, had requested 300,000 US dollars from a senior executive of a troubled oil company for his assistance in obtaining the discontinuance of criminal proceedings concerning the company's vast debts, unquote. In the language of the court judgment, he was arrested on receipt of the bribe, had been sentenced to five years of jail, but a man with such qualifications was not left to rot in prison. In 2005, he commanded the snipers who killed protesters in Kyrgyzstan. In Georgia, he repeated the feat in 2003 during the Rose Revolution. In 2014, he did it again in Kiev, where his snipers killed around 100 men, protesters and police. He was brought to Kiev by Mr. Turchinov, who called himself the acting president and who countersigned Joe Biden's billion dollars grant. In October 2018, the name of Mr. A.B. came up again. Military warehouses of Chernigov had caught fire. Allegedly, thousands of shells stored for fighting the separatists had been destroyed by fire. And it was not the first time of this fire of this kind. The previous one, equally huge, torched Ukrainian army warehouses in Vinitsa in 2017. Altogether, there were 12 huge army arsenal fires for the last few years. Just for 2018, the damage was over $2 billion. When Chief Military Prosecutor of Ukraine, Anatoly Matios, investigated the fires, he discovered that 80% of weapons and shells in the fire warehouses were missing. They weren't destroyed by fire. They weren't there in the first place. Instead, of being used to kill the Russian-speaking Ukrainians of Donetsk, the hardware had been shipped from the port of Nikolaev to Syria to the Islamic rebels and ISIS. And the man who had organized this 
enormous cooperation with our Mr. AB, the old fighter for democracy on behalf of MI6, acting in cahoots with the Minister of Defence, Paul Turak, and Mr. Turchina, the friend of Mr. Biden. They say Mr. Matios was given $10 million for his silence. The loss was of Ukrainian people and of U.S. taxpayers, while the beneficiaries were the deep state, which is probably just another name for the deadly mix of spooks, media, and politicians. And this article was written by Israel Shamir and appeared in the UNS Review. Okay, that's enough on this from me. Seymour Rocks reporting from Down Under. Thank you.